All right, so it is two o'clock, so I will go ahead and start the session. Um, welcome, everyone. Before this session starts, I have a statement to read on behalf of the conference. The Open Education Southern Symposium, OESS, strives to offer an open, inclusive, and friendly environment for all participants. All attendees are expected to help maintain a professional and welcoming environment free of any type of harassment by being mindful of the space and time you are taking up, being aware of the dynamics of power and privilege, being considerate of others' desire for privacy, being respectful of others and accepting that differences in opinion and circumstances create a stronger collaborative environment, actively challenging individual biases and assumptions. Um, I'm also going to paste the link to the full code of conduct here in the chat for anyone to review. Uh, and with that, uh, presenters, you can feel free to get started. All right, thank you so much. And thanks to the conference organizers for um, having us on. We're really excited to be talking to you about a project we've been working on for the better part of um, almost three years now. Um, so we're going to talk about an open pedagogy project we've been doing with some history undergraduates, and um, but we're going to start with some introductions. So my name is Kyle Denlinger. I'm the or my pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm the digital pedagogy and open education librarian at the Z Smith Reynolds Library at Wake Forest University. Kathy. Hi, everyone. My name is Kathy Shields. My pronouns are he, she, her, and I am the research and instruction librarian for history and social science at Wake Forest University. Megan. Megan. And I'm Megan Mulder. My pronouns are she, her, um, and I am the special collections librarian at Wake Forest. And I'm Mir Yarfitz. My pronouns are he, his. Uh, I'm an associate professor of history, um, also in women, gender, and sexuality studies and Jewish studies, also at Wake Forest University. All right. So here's a little bit of an agenda for what we're going to be talking about. Um, we're going to tell you a little bit about the context of Wake Forest and the class and the students. Um, some of the background uh, of our project, as well as some of the planning um, and the problems we were trying to address by the project that we designed. Um, we're also going to spend a lot of time on the guiding principles that shaped our design of the course and our delivery of it, um, and how openness, student agency, and messiness kind of guided all of our practice. And then we're going to spend some time on embracing this messiness um, sh by showing you kind of a guided tour of the various volumes of this open access um, primary source reader that our students have produced over three separate semesters. Um, so some context about what we did. Uh, since 2019, we've been using open pedagogical practices with students to collaborative, collaboratively research, author, and publish three different volumes of an open access primary source reader. Um, we'll get into some more details soon, but basically our students would go through the entire process of publishing a significant work of scholarship from individually researching and authoring chapters based on primary sources, to collaboratively making decisions about the scope of the book, its arrangement, how it will be edited and revised, how it will be licensed, even the cover art um, and all of the back end processes like uh, sorting each other into editorial groups, um, learning how to use publishing software, et cetera. Um, and among other things, we're gonna to try to discuss how open pedagogy has contributed not only to a new way of thinking about course materials, student work, collaboration, and motivation, but how it's forced us to confront issues of power and privilege, power and privilege in the classroom and in knowledge production. Here. Yeah, so I was just going to talk a little bit about where this class came from and sort of why um, I started pulling together this um, superhero team of librarians to work with me. Um, so the institution, Wake Forest University, uh, is in Winston-Salem, North Carolina sort of a medium-sized city in, in the South, obviously. Um, it's a private school, it's sort of mid-sized. We have about 5,000 undergraduates. It's a, a liberal arts focus. We also have very large, um, kind of very large business school that has an undergraduate major. And it's in many ways, it's a professionally oriented institution. Um, so, you know, there are some tensions around encouraging students to be enthusiastic about the liberal arts. It, you know, it can, there can be a little bit of a tension there. So that's part of where this, uh, this course is coming from is also in the context of being a, a gen ed class, um, which we weirdly call divisionals. Um, and so the way that, uh, you know, I was thinking about this as a, as a way of bringing students into history who may have thought that history was something other than what we 
historians want students to think that it is. That's sort of often the case that um, students have already decided by the time they get here that they know what history is and they don't like it, or they know what it is and they do like it, in which case what they like tends to be something that's quite different from say what I as a you know social historian, cultural historian, and scholar of you know women, gender, and sexuality studies want them to think. Um, so this class is also cross-listed in women, gender, and sexuality studies. Um, the students, you know, sort of it's, the class are capped at 25. They've been full. Um, it's the classes have ended up being in many ways quite different from who ends up in a typical Wake Forest class, particularly a sort of typical Gen Ed class. Um, generally, the students are there because they're excited about the, the, the subject of the class, but also increasingly because they heard about what it was that we were doing from other students. Um, and particularly, there tend to be more, you know, uh, BIPOC students, more LGBTQ students, you know, to some degree, more, more first gen students, more students who are interested specifically in issues of social justice and activism. Um, and so, you know, what that's ended up with is sometimes students who, um, you know, disagree with one each with one another in a variety of ways and that's sort of part of what we're managing as as we structure this this collaboration between us which we'll get into i don't know if folks have anything else they want to add on who the class is but we can um yeah we can move into what problems um i set up the class to address um so again as i was saying uh you know i was thinking about the the how to get kind of different students into history classes and approaching the, the subject, sort of the, their idea about what history is differently. Um, and these were sort of some of the issues that I had laid out initially, um, you know, wanting to build their skills towards really doing historical research, broaden their ideas about what history is beyond kind of narrow conceptions of, um, you know, sort of general white male leaders and wars and, you know, political transitions, um, really into much broader understandings of social history and social movements and that you know things that students are interested in today whatever those things are also exist in some form in the past um you know as far as attitudes you know as i mentioned are there's some tension in the institution around students you know feeling like they should be preparing themselves for a particular career um, versus thinking about you know liberal arts and humanities styles of thinking as well as skills as things that might be relevant to their lives might not lead to an immediate career path but you know allow different things to happen in, in their lives in the future um, and then, you know, a sense of, of connection, sort of trying to build something for students that would help them make links between different things that they're studying. Um, so the way that this course was developed, you know, we, I started, I'd gotten a course development grant for this, um, you know, a couple summers ago, it seems like really a million years ago now. Um, and we did the kind of backwards course design that many of you may be familiar with. So that was, you know, how it was sort of starting from these various problems and goals. And as I started thinking about this, um, you know, I began to reach out to some librarians. You know, I first reached out to um, Kathy Shields because I sort of knew her and, and had a sense that she, um, you know, could help with really thinking about what, what kind of how to build students' skills in these arenas. And then I also um, reached out to Megan, who I had worked with in, in special collections and bringing students into special collections before. That was something I really envisioned as key to this. And um, also, I had just started getting to know Kyle, and I knew that he had really thoughts about pedagogy that I was really excited about. So we all started sort of talking together and increasingly working together um, in summer 2019. We did the first iteration of the course, fall 2019. Um, you know, there was, and there was a way in which we were definitely building it while flying the ship and, you know, particularly around the mechanics of writing a whole book together while trying to, you know, publish it digitally and, and also in print. Uh, Kyle will talk more about the messiness. Then the next time we did it in spring 2020, we um, brought in the students from the previous course with a kind of book release party at the beginning of the class where we had a published copy of the book, got the two classes together, did a panel of kind of experts from the, the first book and, and we're thus trying to build connections across semesters. Um, you know, as you may notice from the date, there was a major change at our spring break and the students didn't come back. Um, and so the, the class was very much sort of redesigned um, on the fly. Um, and we sort of shifted the focus of that project um, in collaboration with the students, sort of what do you want to do? And a lot of them shifted what they wanted to do to being something engaging with the crisis of the current moment and thinking about crisis historically. 
um, and we'll talk more about how that went. Then the third iteration this last fall was entirely digital, entirely remote. Um, and if you are interested, we can go into detail about how we did all that technically. Um, but we were able to continue the collaboration, the community sense, and all of us working together um, entirely on Zoom. Yeah, so throughout all of this, um, we were really trying to be mindful of these three kind of guiding principles. Um, we wanted our students to do authentic work that was meaningful to them. We didn't want them to do um, the standard research paper, which uh, if you're familiar with the concept of disposable assignments, and I'll talk about that later, um, we didn't want them to be producing disposable assignments that would be graded and thrown in, thrown in the garbage at the end of the semester. We also wanted to honor their labor. Um, I'll show you some numbers later that are quite shocking in how much um, intellectual labor you could perceive as being wasted every semester, every year, um, because students are doing these kind of standard research papers instead of doing work that adds value to the world. Um, we also wanted to cultivate student agency. We wanted to give them voice and choice in the classroom. And we had to relinquish a lot of control and a lot of power to do that. Um, and we're gonna talk about some of the um, things we did, the pedagogical decisions that we've made um, to cultivate that agency um, and also embrace that messiness. Kathy? Sure, so the first principle is that idea of doing authentic work. And um, one of the big things that Mir um, was thinking about in designing this class was rather than acting as passive observers of history, right? We really wanted students to think about themselves as creators of historical scholarship, um, experience that excitement with the archive. That is like the, the phrase that sort of rings, um, says that most clearly for me in this class, is like this excitement of the archive. Um, mechanisms of scholarship and those inherent structural qualities that also affect. So how can students engage in all of these? And so Megan Mulder and I um, were involved in helping students think through that in, in, in their research. Yeah, and just to talk a little bit more about this goal, you know, the, my vision for this class was built on, I don't know, what I think about is sort of the place as a historian where I experience often the greatest joy, which is kind of digging through moldy boxes in a dim room and then finding some mysterious scrap of hard to read handwriting that answers an obsessive question that I've had, right? <clears throat> kind of opens a bunch of new ones. And I wanted to show, you know, often first year students that history can be that, right? And more like the work of a research scientist or more like the work of a of a novelist who tries to piece these scraps together into some sort of story, um, then you know, memorizing lists of dates and wars and political leaders. And what I was imagining was sort of what it would take to get you know, first year, second year students physically into our special collections archive room at the Wake Forest Library, which was actually very well illuminated, it's not dim. Um, and I tried to build backwards what it would take to make it possible for them to have that experience of sort of discovery, right? Obviously, we don't discover things in archives any more than Columbus discovered the Americas. But like, what would it take to support undergrads to have enough skills, enough curiosity to be able to have an exciting archival experience, right? For those things to resonate with them and for them to be able to ask questions of those um, things that they found, put them into some sort of context. Um, so I worked on this scaffolding with Megan and Kathy and then also as I chose materials for the syllabus, um, you know, sort of trying to build up a structure that would enable them to go into the particular physical archive that we had, as well as engaging with the digital archive. That we had. Um, and then working with Megan to find things in the archive that would be accessible and relate to the themes of the course, and then kind of set up enough content for the students in a gen ed course to interpret what could be obscure materials, right? Um, and then also working with, with both Megan and Kathy to build up their kind of primary source analysis skills, doing different exercises along the way, sort of both before and after we went into the physical archives um, and doing sort of various kinds of exploratory exercises. Um, and I think, you know, Megan will probably talk more about this, but one reason I was setting them up in small groups in the archive was to, again, center the idea of excitement that, you know, maybe one of them is able to find in their folders something that is interesting to them and then they can share that excitement with another student. So this collaborative element sort of happening at every level. And I just realized I don't know if we actually said the title of the course or the overall subject. Um, so this is a course in gender and sexuality in world history. So it's cast broadly. Um, and we, we, but the, the way that the class was structured sort of with um, the content um, 
you know, we, it was mostly 19th and 20th century. Um, my, <clears throat> my focus is sort of Latin American history, but I was trying to give students sort of tastes of different structures of gender and sexuality and sort of big, big ways of um, thinking about those sort of getting into the fields as the fields have developed over time, sort of historiographically, um, as opposed to, you know, uh, there was no chronology of gender and sexuality in X place or Y place. We moved around sort of somewhat, somewhat chronologically through time, but the idea was centering skill building sort of every time we would, you know, do readings, they were always um, sort of skill oriented and sort of how do you use this way of thinking to then look at premise. Yay. Um, so I'll talk just a little bit about specifically about the um, in-person sessions that we did in um, in the special collections and archives. Um, we were able to do this for the fall 19, 2019 class and the spring 2020 class. The last fall's class, you know, was entirely virtual. So unfortunately, we weren't able to do in-person sessions, but hopefully um, we will be in, in future classes. Um, so I'll describe just briefly what we did and tell a little bit about how, um, how we worked to have it align with the class goal of having the students um, do authentic work of historical research. Um, so the first class visit to Special Collections and Archives occurred very early in the semester, I think actually the first week of the, of the class. Um, and the emphasis was really on getting students comfortable with using the archives um, and letting them um, experience the excitement of encountering, you know, primary source materials in their original formats. Um, Mira and I selected a really wide variety of materials. That was um, another um, goal was to broaden their ideas of what counted as you know, a primary source, what counted as history. Um, so there were a lot of different things. We set up different stations um, and the students moved around in various groups. They rotated so that they would have a chance to look at all the different types of materials that we had um, had available for them and then had a brief class discussion at the end. Um, for this first session, there was no you know, really specific pedagogical goal other than having the students experience the archives and experience the excitement of looking at archival materials. Um, the second class visit um, was about a, a month later um, and it involved more in-depth analysis of um, just two collections that we pre-selected from the archives. Um, these collections were, um, one of them was the Wake Forest uh, Women's Government Association materials, which you can actually see um, pictured on this slide. Um, this dates from about the 1940s through the 1970s. It includes things like, um, this um, this published guide to rules and regulations for women students at Wake Forest, um, and also a large archival collection of um, uh, meeting minutes and um, lots and lots of discipline cases, which the students found very interesting. Um, and then the other um, a collection that we looked at was a large collection of correspondence from a North Carolina woman who um, taught in a mission school in China in the first half of the 20th century. So both of these were really large collections that allowed students to kind of dig in and experience the early stages of encountering a primary source and trying to sort of make sense of it. Um, I think one thing that was important for the classes that were able to be there in person was that using the physical materials um, um, kind of facilitates the experience of seeing primary source in context. I mean, you can do that with digital materials too, but it can be a little more challenging. It's different when you can actually see, you know, these boxes of, of stuff and how one item in it relates to the other things, um, which is really important, especially in a class like this, where one of the things that we're trying to do is identify gaps and omissions in the archival record. Um, so those were our two class sessions. Um, and I did find it to be a challenge um, to first think about how to facilitate students doing the process of real historical research. Um, when most of them had ever done archival research before, um, they weren't bringing any background knowledge about the materials. Um, and I didn't want to, you know, kill the fun and excitement part by, you know, having to do an information dump and giving a lot of lectures. So we had to think about how that we were going to be able to actually accomplish this. Um, for me, kind of two things ended up being being important and key. And there were a lot of other things that, that you know, Mir will probably talk about too. Um, but two things were important for me. Um, first of all, the class sessions themselves were very sort of unstructured. Um, I might not call them messy just because our processing archivist doesn't like me using that word in reference to, you know, collections she has very carefully um, arranged. So we weren't messy, but we were, it was, you know, we did relinquish a lot of control to the students. Um, there was no particular assignment. There was no, you know, document analysis worksheet, which we, you know, will use a lot of times in, in archival classes. Um, we basically just sort of plunked the students down um, in front of the materials um, and let them, you know, just see what they found interesting, see what, what questions they had, what, you know, what they could make of the stuff. Um, 
and hope that, you know, in the process of discussing it with, you know, their fellow students and with us, um, they would experience that process of learning to make sense of a primary source. Um, but I will say that in order for us to be able to relinquish this amount of control during the actual class session, um, we actually had to do a lot of planning. I think I probably did more planning for, for these, you know, unstructured sessions than I would do for a session where I was, you know, more in control and more guiding them through the materials. Um, fortunately, as Mir said, he brought the librarians in very early in his planning process, which was great. We had time to to think about what materials we were going to use, um, and I was able to get a really clear sense of what Mir wanted to accomplish in the sessions. Um, but two things that were important was that we did have to be very deliberate in, in choosing materials and pre-selecting materials since I wasn't gonna guide them step from step through that and they were gonna kind of come to their own conclusions. So that was important. And we also had to be very deliberate about creating a space and an experience that would um, allow students to be comfortable jumping in and talking about materials um, that were probably out of their comfort zone that were certainly you know unfamiliar and weird and possibly triggering sometimes for them. Um, so that was, it was important to think about that and be deliberate about it. Um, so yeah, number one planning, it was important to plan the messiness I found for those sessions. Um, and the second and last thing that I found important that I didn't really even think of until after we had done a few class sessions and I had to, time to think about it. Um, but I think it was really good that our students always had more questions than we were able to answer in the actual session. Um, and all the class sessions, Mir and I would, you know, circulate around the room while the students were looking at the materials. We would answer any questions, you know, that came up, you know, as 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 we were able to. Um, and if I knew the, you know, if a student asked me a question, I knew the answer off the top of my head. I would just answer them. I didn't do the thing, you know, with, you know, well, how would you go about? What do, what what do you think? How would you go about doing that? Just because that wasn't what we were trying to accomplish in these sessions, I wanted to, you know, signal that this was not like a a fake research assignment where the instructors had already, you know, come up with conclusions A, B, and C, and we were just seeing if they could get there too. Um, that this really was an open ended, you know, um, historical research. Um, so I would answer questions, and I've if I knew them, but. Um, but what was great was that they always had questions that neither Mir nor I were able to answer off the top of our heads. Um, you know, so the answer was, I don't know, that's weird. We'll have to, we'll have to look into it. We'll have to think about it. Um, and this gave us the chance to model the real experience of a historian encountering a primary source for the first time. Um, I think it was reassuring for the students to see that even, you know, the experts didn't have all the answers all the time. And um, I hope this helped them understand that, you know, whatever novel, level of knowledge they were bringing with them, they were going through the same process of, you know, historical research that we were. Everyone, everyone has to do the same thing. Um, and hopefully that carried through for them as they did their, their later final research projects. Um, and I'll turn it over to Kathy now to kind of describe some later steps in that process. Yeah, so while Megan always gets to have fun in the physical archive, I get to work with the students on the digital archive. Um, and also builds on the work that she did in putting primary sources in context. So early on, as we shared, Mir and I met and talked about his vision for the class, which informed the way that I pretty much approached everything that I did. Um, we collaborated on a research guide for the class, which I've put an image of here, which not just provided links to potential resources, but also had a section on you know, how to use primary sources, what questions to ask of primary sources, and also linked out to prior versions of the book after the first semester to get that sense of collaborative, um, collaborative and connection and collaboration between students. Um, as Mir mentioned, the scope was pretty wide. So we kind of focused on 19th and 20th century, but students had a lot of agency in what they chose. So we provided a really wide range of potential resources that they could use um, that represented a wider range of materials than I, I might normally provide for a research guide. So we had sort of traditional you know, digitized collections of documents and things, newspapers. We also provided oral histories, podcasts, visual sources, um, because we really wanted to give students the freedom to choose a source that they connected with. Um, we included both openly available collections as well as subscription resources available through our library. Um, and that, that's really, it was good that we had sort of an emphasis on some digital collections and eBooks as well for the spring and fall of 2020, um, since students had to rely on more, more heavily on those digital resources in those semesters. Um, and I also met or, or you know, uh, conversed via email with students, uh, so, sorry, Mary and I met and conversed via email prior to each instruction session, um, and that was really helpful to get a sense of that particular class, you know, where their challenges were, um, what questions had come up in other class meetings and things that we specifically wanted to, to address with those students. So for the actual instruction in each semester, uh, I came into the class three times. And although we tweaked the sessions each semester to meet things at that particular class, the basic structure remained the same. 
So in that first session, we talked about primary sources and students explored some of the collections that were linked on that research guide. Um, and we talked about the difficulty that historians face in finding primary sources on certain topics. You know, why aren't there primary sources on X, Y, or Z? Um, or even in finding information about certain topics within larger collections. So for example, the terminology used to describe individuals or groups from marginalized communities that, that has changed over time. And that can make it really difficult to search the full text of a historical document know what language to put in. Um, and some of that languages can be painful and hurtful. Um, but by starting with those collections, students were able to identify a few primary sources that excited them and then start to dig into their meaning and context. So in the second session, uh, we talked about secondary sources and how to begin to put those primary sources into that larger context. Students worked in small groups to generate questions about their primary sources. And then we explored some of the places that they might go to answer those questions, you know, books, databases, websites. Um, and we also had to address some of the issues that historians face when there's a lack of scholarship on an individual or a topic and talk about how to sort of research around a particular source. How can we find out more about it even if we're not looking up this specific name or this specific um, event? And then in our third session, which I know Kyle will probably talk about this more later on, um, we discuss citation, which is a pretty tedious task, but it's really important when creating a work that's meant to be shared openly. Um, anyone who's ever had, any historians who've ever had to use a, a list of footnotes to try to find sources knows how important that citation is. And after the first iteration of the class, we realized that that need for consistent citation for the primary sources um, was really important, uh, especially those that were visual or weren't from a, sort of a traditional printed source. So that was part of that messiness, right, of figuring out how to help students work through those more challenging sources and how to cite those in a way that was somewhat consistent. Um, I also met individually with students in person and via Zoom in all three semesters to provide additional guidance um, around primary sources, around secondary sources, or whatever challenges they were facing. And we wanted to include just a few quotes here to get across that idea of students really feeling like they were doing authentic work. Um, so these all happened to be from the fall 2020 semester, which was fully virtual. Um, but I love this quote from a student who, who said they, they felt like a real researcher collecting evidence and felt really proud of the work that they did and the, that they have a you know, final book, an actual book published at the end. Um, I also love this one, um, that this student really um, was willing to um, take a risk and approach research in a new way because of this idea of uh, authentic research and the structures of the class, which we'll talk about more later on, but that, that really motivated the student to um, go for a topic that they wouldn't have typically if they'd been you know, maybe doing something for a grade um, and set it as part of this larger collaborative project. And finally, this is a long one. I'm not gonna talk about all of it, but this quote really just embodies so much of what we try to do as librarians, which is you know, making the library less intimidating, making connections with students so they feel comfortable coming back, giving them a foundation for using our resources. Um, and then for this class, there's that additional bonus, the excitement of being able to engage with a 150 year old book and use it to write something and become a published author with a book in that same library. So I love that this, this student really felt like the work that they did was important and that they gained something um, beyond this class from that experience. And Kyle, I think this is you. Sorry, of course I was muted. That's um, amazing. Uh, I just did that. So <laughs> our second principle um, is that we wanted to honor student student labor. We um, felt that by acknowledging the value of student intellectual labor and granting it appropriate weight um, and giving students ownership over a project that resulted in a public work intended for use and not only use, but reuse by an audience of their peers, that the students would be more engaged creatively and would hold themselves to higher standards. And we found that those things bore themselves out. Um, we're going to go a little quickly through the rest of this, but I want to spend some time on this idea of intellectual labor and open pedagogy and the intersections there. Um, so it's it's tough to talk about intellectual labor from a place that doesn't sound really, um, you know, like based in capitalism. That's not what I'm going for here, but um, by asking students to do work that is inauthentic and that really is only relevant for the here and now that has no um, uh, lasting impact, students uh, feel that their time is being wasted. It could be considered busy work. Now, not to say that every research paper ever produced is uh, worthless, but um, I think there's so many more opportunities to uh, engage students in really authentic work that um, 
can be used and reused um, from semester to semester and um, even beyond our uh, campus walls. Um, but before I get into intellectual labor and open pedagogy, I wanted to talk about some numbers really quick. So some math. Um, to demonstrate kind of the scale of this, uh, in 2020, in the fall of 2021, it's pro projected that there's going to be 19.8 million undergrads enrolled at U.S. public uh, at U.S. higher education institutions, um, and this is a super conservative estimate. But let's just say that they only write two research papers per year, um, and there's some uh, there's the Rice um, workload estimator uh, that from Rice University. Uh, using some estimations they have made, we can maybe guess that it takes students about 18 hours per paper without any drafting. It's just like they do the research and they um, put it out and it's, that's like assuming like a six page paper. So crunch all those numbers and conservatively US undergrads will spend uh, 712 million 800,000 hours in 2021 writing research papers. And that is a lot, a lot of intellectual labor. Um, it's probably about as much time as they spent like on the Apollo program or something like that, right? Every single year they're doing this. And um, if we could take just a tenth of that, like even 1% of that, um, and devote that effort toward work that has lasting impact, that is um, that has the purpose of adding value to the world um, outside of the classroom, we could do quite a lot. And that's what we intended to do here. Um, so we chose authentic student-driven work and open pedagogy primarily to honor student labor and elevate their work to being worthy of their time. Our promise to them was that their work would be read and reused, studied and critiqued, emulated and preserved. And this proved to be incredibly motivating to them. Um, one of the ways we hope to honor student labor was by creating an open, open educational resource. Um, of course, it could be reused and remixed. Um, and, but in order to get there, we had uh, to help the students better understand and critique concepts of openness and ownership. Um, and as you might imagine, openness was a fairly new concept to almost all of our students. Um, I spent a single 50 minute class visit facilitating an exploration of copyright in the Creative Commons um, with an emphasis on the five R permissions of OER. So revise, remix, reuse, retain, and redistribute if you're familiar with the work of David Wiley. Um, the, the goal here was to get them familiar enough with the concepts that they could collectively make some decisions about how they wanted to share their work, uh, whether that's individually with different licenses for each essay or collectively with a single license for each for the entire book. Um, I thought that this session was going to be boring for them. I thought they would completely gl gloss over um, and ignore most of what I had to say, but um, as I'll share in a minute, that was not at all the case. Uh, we explored how additional attributes like or of common Creative Commons licenses, like um, non-commercial, no derivatives, share alike, can sometimes complicate downstream uses and make their student work uh, less open. But we also tried to approach it from a place of empowering the students to make an informed decision that would honor their labor while giving some freedom to future readers. Um, students really seemed to take to this idea right away. They saw the value in using open licenses to facilitate greater access to marginalized stories and reduce the reliance on commercial textbooks, which is a justice issue, but they were somewhat divided on how their work, how open their work should be. Um, in fact, in this project's first iteration, the students had a super heated debate about the non-commercial and share-alike attributes, um, which Mir and I just kind of looked at each other in that class session and we're like, <laughs> we did not expect this at all, but it was amazing. Um, ultimately, the students settled on the Creative Commons attribution non-commercial share alike for their first volume. Um, we also wanted them to explore the, re the relationship between openness, public participation, and risk. We were clear that all decisions about openness and publicness were to reside with them, the students, and that any one of them could choose to participate differently if they wanted, either through a pseudonym or an alternative assignment. Uh, additionally, we wanted to crit uh, we critiqued uh, traditional ideas of ownership. Uh, what does it mean for someone to own intellectual property? What if that property is someone's story? Um, how are our attitudes toward openness and ownership influenced by colonialist ideas uh, of what is and can be owned? Um, who owns the means of knowledge production and who gets uh, included and who gets excluded? Whose stories get preserved and told? Uh, and similarly, we talked about the open about the pedagogical implications for students to fully own the process of knowledge production. Um, for many of our students who are interested in justice issues and campus campus activism, uh, this project very much scratched that itch, which was extremely motivating. Um, I also want to spend some time talking about the platform we chose. Uh, so going into this, I knew that um, I wanted 
uh, a platform that was based on open source software. We explored a number of different alternatives, whether that was creating just standalone websites, um, using hypothesis annotation software to annotate some kind of text version of the primary sources they chose. But ultimately we settled on Pressbooks um, and that kind of led a few of the de design decisions um, uh, further on. So we wanted a platform that was open source that gave us a lot of export options uh, for both preservation and portability concerns. Um, and we wanted a platform that uh, had some way to give students access as authors um, and Pressbooks then became kind of a natural choice. Uh, so we created a sandbox Pressbook space where the students authored and formatted their chapters, um, they inserted images and et cetera. Um, not all of them took to it very well. <laughs> it was messy and extremely complicated. And I had to do a lot of work on the back end to get the books publication ready. Um, things like standardizing footnotes and captions and citations, headings, image placement, and all of that. But we definitely learned a lot uh, in the process and um, wound up using it again for the third iteration. Um, and our third and final principle is that we wanted to relinquish as much control as we could and cultivate student agency. And by doing so, in tandem with doing authentic work that honors their labor, we believe that students would be more engaged and more intrinsically motivated to produce a high quality work of scholarship. Um, and here we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the changes we made to our teaching that serve this end. Yeah, so in talking about this course, I mean, we're, we're hoping to inspire folks to maybe try some of the pieces that might fit in your situation. Um, you know, we don't feel like no one has to do all of the exact things that we did. These were just the things that we wanted to do. Um, but we did feel like the overall kind of synergy that we got wouldn't have worked without the ungrading style of the class. And, you know, for those of you who are, who are not familiar with, with ungrading, various folks have talked about this type of teaching in various ways. Um, you know, Kyle introduced me to the work of, of Jesse Strommel. And, you know, well, the way that I explain it to students is this, like, Number one, like I, as a as a faculty member, surprisingly, perhaps to them, hate grading, and I wish I didn't have to do it. Um, it, it sucks the joy out of my teaching experience um, more than almost anything else. But more importantly, you know, really compelling research argues that grades make students think less deeply, um, avoid risk taking, and you know, to really lose interest in the process of learning. Grades don't really provide good incentives or good feedbacks or good markers of learning and erase the ways that learning can be idiosyncratic and subjective and emotional. Um, also grades obviously encourage competition and tend to reproduce existing structures of privilege depending on what kind of background students are coming in with. Um, and we certainly notice very high levels of anxiety at Wake or, or around grades, um, which completely, you know, is, is not in proportion with the kind of actual role that they play in students' future. Um, because though we do have to turn in grades, uh, we set up a system where, you know, students would be assigned a grade at the midterm and at the final points. Um, but the way we did it is students assigned their own grades and wrote a, you know, a, a lengthy text and, you know, talked to them and sort of tweaked what I suggested that they do in that self-assessment. There was also a daily self-assessment that they did a brief one every day at the end of class. Um, so, you know, part of what I, I did along the way with this was kind of meta, talking to them about the importance of their own ability to self-assess and self-regulate and how that's something that they would need to build coming out of high school. That's not something that they necessarily would have built already in high school. And um, also talking to them a lot about the, the challenges of taking these kinds of risks and of sort of learning to be their own, um, sort of monitoring for themselves, what they thought, what were their standards, what were their values, what were their goals. And we would, um, you know, several times sort of students would themselves, we, we laid out collective class goals in various ways. And then I talked to students about selecting from among those or elsewhere, their own values, their own goals. Did they want to work, um, for example, on speaking more in class or on stepping back, you know, those sorts of things. And then encouraging them to sort of discuss in their self-assessments, how did they do towards those goals? Um, and this ties in very much with this principle of, of radical trust, right? I, I certainly find that students are their own harshest critics. Um, I, I don't think that they're lazy. If a student appears disconnected from my class, I just try to remember how much they have going on in their lives. And if they're super checked out, there's probably something wrong, not that they just don't care. Um, and when I've approached them with trust that they'll show up as best they can, it really I've rarely felt like they're taking advantage of the situation or taking advantage of me. But then using these self-reflections, you know, they often really openly grapple with how they're struggling to prioritize things, 
or how they might be doing the work differently or earlier. And then I kind of encourage them to go in that direction. You know, I have individual meetings with them often if there's any sort of potential crisis or sometimes group meetings after classes. Um, yeah, so these pieces really were key to the, the way in which this class functioned collaboratively, but also students took risks that they wouldn't have otherwise uh, taken. Um, so, and just very briefly to continue with speaking about the collaborative elements of the class, you know, as we've discussed, the structure of the class was really built between myself and the librarians. And then we, you know, very much continued to work together through each iteration of the class. Um, among the students themselves, collaboration happened in several different ways. A lot of the class activities were kind of various kinds of small group activities, large group discussions of text, small group activities, you know, related to um, skills, concepts, readings. Um, and then with the project, you know, most of the chapters were done individually. Some students did choose to do them in pairs, um, but then there were various kinds of collaborations in those specific projects through regular peer reviews and check-ins, through the formation of kind of um, class chapter groupings. Um, and during that COVID pivot, we created kind of little trusted peer groups so that students met with one another between classes and kind of helped each other move along on their projects, helped each other, you know, figure out how to use the digital resources, um, you know, think through if they were struggling with, um, you know, formatting or anything like that, they could also help each other in that way. And we also set up cross-cutting working groups for a cover art, for a title, for acknowledgements, you know, that sort of thing. And then, you know, as Kyle noted, there were these various big group collaborative decisions from the Creative Commons licensing, but also we collectively kind of analyzed prior books in the class to sort of set new goals. So they were like, oh, this previous book didn't do much outside of the US, we would like to do more outside of the US. And then they made their decisions um, collectively, not just on what they individually wanted to do, but what would work the best for the group. And in the final feedback, you know, many students said, while they were very proud of their individual chapters, they were even more proud of what the whole class did together. They also saw that they were individually able to do better work as they did this kind of um, mutual support through their own research. And my hope is that this helps them in, in other courses to not just do their work by themselves in their rooms, but to continue seeking out ways to work together. Yeah, so finally, by letting go of so much of this control, both in grading and how students organize themselves, um, we really needed to be comfortable with this messiness. Um, we could have approached this from a very top-down uh, uh, kind of uh, traditional approach where we pre-designed everything and made sure everything was really well scaffolded um, and probably would have come up with a very underwhelming um, project. Uh, so some of our processes broke down almost immediately um, in that they became apparent. And we, I, I remember um, doing a demonstration of Pressbooks when I learned that there was a an image attachment storage quota and we exceeded it with like one image. And so I had to <laughs> find a way to get around that. Um, the students did not produce perfect work. Uh, some of their work had pretty terrible citations. Some of their images had watermarks and were clearly just downloaded from Google Images. And so we worked hard to fix all of these things, but um, there were just so many things that we could not have predicted. Um, and if we had tried to control them, had would have resulted in a much um, less authentic experience. Um, but we've also improved our process each time uh, to help streamline things for the students. And But if we wanted to give them the wheel, so to speak, we needed to trust them and not hover over them the entire time. Um, our primary concern the whole time was for their learning. And there wasn't a single part of this that wasn't instructive for them. Uh, they learned that rigorous scholarship is difficult to produce. They learned that a book represents an entire process that includes research, writing, technical skills, legal concerns, and lots of set setbacks. Um, they learned that collaboration is difficult even in the best of circumstances. Um, but they also learned that none of them could have done this on their own. So. Um, we started by thinking like, where are the places where we can provide guardrails? Um, and where are those places where we could let students figure things out on their own? And that required us to um, really embrace that messiness. Um, but we also learned that if things are messy, they could also be easily reconfigured. Um, if we hadn't strongly embraced this messiness, all of this, uh, it, it, if we had insisted on top-down control, rigorous grading and individual work, then responding to the numerous challenges we faced throughout all of it would have been nearly impossible. Um, and I know we want to get to um, some Q&A. So we're going to quickly fly through some examples to the actual books that students produced. Um, and I'll put the links to these in the chat, kind of one at a time. So this is the first volume. Um, 
from fall 2019. And here's kind of an example of what one of the student chapters looked like. They looked at some advertisements and, um, and Mir, if you want to kind of unmute and kind of talk about these uh, as I go through them. Um, but you can see the how students organize things based on around power, gender roles, stereo, gender stereotypes, reproductive rights. Um, so that's the first edition. The second edition was the COVID transition. And we kind of opened things up entirely and wanted students to um, choose a format that meant something to them. We did not say that there was any kind of standardized um, chapter. And so this student in particular um, produced some really interesting work where they did a photo essay that um, kind of was juxtaposed alongside quotes from a primary source. So this is a uh, from a 1918 letter during this, uh, the, the 1918 flu, flu pandemic uh, where the student, you know, wishes they were at Wake Forest and this is the, uh, you know, a quote from that letter. Um, another really great example of this was this student here who um, produced a zine. Um, the student's father was an EMT in the 1980s during the AIDS epidemic or the AIDS pandemic epidemic, I'm sorry. And um, she found her father's manual, EMT manual and contrasted some of the um, advice given to EMTs on AIDS and compared that to some of the um, early, more xenophobic re rhetoric in the early days of uh, COVID. So I'll put that link in the chat. Uh, it was a really interesting use case. And because the formats were so different, um, we had to basically go with a PDF and we worked with um, our kind of in-house publishing group here to put it on Biblio board. Um, and then this third iteration is very similar to the first one. And um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about them, but feel free to look at those. They're all um, oh, Creative Commons licensed. You can download them as you wish. Um, and those were all things that were very important to us. Um, and also, we were able to print the first and third editions. So they're like actual books you could hold in your hands, and students really love that. So I'm going to um, go back to the slides and say thank you. And we'll take a couple of minutes for questions, I guess. Question mark. <laughs> thank you so much. And I guess if you want to use the Q&A or the chat, we'd be happy to take some questions. And while um, folks are thinking about asking, oh, there's one. Um, Sarah asks, do you remember some of the students' specific concerns about the different CC licenses? Um, yeah, I can talk about that for a moment. Uh, Mir, feel free to chime in. But um, there were a few students that were um, concerned about the non-commercial attribute, I remember, um, that were, um, some were insistent on it and some were like, you know, if, you know, any, anybody wants to come along and use my work to sell it, that'd be fine with me. Um, there were some that were really divided on the no derivatives. They wanted their work to be kind of frozen in time um, and didn't want people coming along and changing it. But then a lot of students were, um, well, no, we want people to improve this over time. And so uh, they were all, it, it, this was all based on a 50 minute introduction to Creative Commons. But um, so some of their concerns were like very surface level, but it, it was amazing to me how deeply they thought about it, even after that short introduction. Mir, do you have anything? Yeah, one of the things that just came up and we talked about with them was just how much they'd internalized sort of capitalist principles around work and copyright and sharing. And like they were not also super comfortable really tweaking, adjusting, modifying, editing prior students' work, right? They were like, we want that to be frozen in time. And then we want ours to be frozen in time. Um, and that was just an interest, you know, that was, we were hoping that they would see the remixing value or, or more of a kind of collaboration across time. Um, and, and we just found that was challenging. And then, yeah, they're resisting, they're like, we don't want anyone making money off of anything um, because we hate capitalism. And then some of them were like, well, wait, 
if somebody wants to like include this in a textbook about teaching or about whatever, like that would be cool, you know? Um, so yeah, the way that those, yeah, the way that those, those internalized messages played out was, was very interesting. Yeah. Um, Esther asks a question and Mir, you're probably more qualified to answer this one. Do you see it? Um, Esther asks what percentage of the class was dedicated to imparting knowledge uh, versus um, working on the project? Yeah, so I mean, Esther, I really thought about the class as like much more of a skills class. So I felt like I was thinking about it as how can I give students sort of the tools of working as a historian of gender and sexuality. And it was as far as giving like, con so it's sort of the content was like as needed. So, you know, for example, before the special collection session where we looked at, you know, the Baptist missionary, we did some reading on sort of trying to put that into context or, you know, trying to put the, what the college co-eds were doing in a particular context, or, you know, we would dig in on certain, um, you know, international examples of, let's say different forms of thinking about gender and sexual identity as you know, where there were certain, certain like key, I don't know, I was like, I had like you know, five principles of like thinking like a gender or sexuality historian. That I was like, okay, they need to grasp this concept. Um, but I, I was really focusing on the applications more than like, they did not come out with any chronologies. Um, it was much more, I kept talking to them about it as like, um, you're, you're in a, you're in a laboratory that you have the microscope, these are different slides you can put on the microscope and you don't, they didn't get a super clear sense of what everyone has always done with that microscope, but they had, you know, sort of enough to try to use, to try to use the lens, to look at some of those things. All right, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you all so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure sharing our work with you um, and all of those works are Creative Commons licensed. So if you teach history or know someone who does, um, feel free to have them use those. Uh, we'd love to hear about folks that do that. Thank you so much to all of the panelists. Again, I am going to go ahead and stop the recording. Um,